Good morning, Indian Land Community Church. We're excited to be with you guys this morning uh, over your internet screens, whatever that might be, your iPad, your iPad, your sound bar, just crank it up and let's worship together this morning. We're really honored to have an invite from Pastor Shannon to be with you guys this morning. And not only are we all disconnected with a little social isolation, but we're broadcasting from you guys all the way up from Canova, West Virginia this morning. So, so we're excited to be with you guys. Let's worship together this morning, do some singing. Here we go. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My way I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder You wanna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes The king is alive A reason hallelujah With everything inside of me A reason hallelujah
Which heaven's joys are bright heaven's sun Heart of my own heart would ever be full Still be my vision Good morning, church family. So, uh, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's afternoon, depending on exactly when uh, you're engaging uh, in this video and, and participating with us in this worship service. But no matter what time of day or night it is for you, uh, we are just so thankful that you have uh, that you've chosen uh, to take a little bit of time out and to uh, to engage in uh, in this time of worship with us. And so, um, wherever you are, whatever time of day it is. Uh, my prayer is that you are safe, um, that your family is safe, and that uh, um, that no matter what's going on, uh, that this time will be an encouragement to you, and that uh, you know that you realize uh, no matter what's going on, that if you uh, have a need, if you have a prayer request, that there's something that Indian Land Community Church can do to help serve you. Uh, in this time that you can reach out to us. Um, I also want to just take a moment real quick to remind you that um, if there's any um, any sermons that you've missed out on, any uh, anything that you need to do to connect with us, you can do so uh, on our website, IndianLandCC.com. Uh, there, if you go to the uh, download page, you can grab uh, all of our sermon notes and uh, watch the previous videos. Uh, I also want to let you know that uh, while you're on our website, uh, if you would, if you have the ability, uh, we encourage you to donate. Uh, you can uh, submit a tax-deductible donation to us through the website. Um, those contributions actually help us to serve the community uh, and to meet the needs of the people who are, who are close to us but far from God and, and even help us to uh, expand this ministry beyond just Indian land and Fort Mill uh, and the Charlotte communities, uh, but help us to... Um, help fund missionaries around the world through cooperative giving. And so uh, no matter what's going on, uh, if you just go to our website, you can connect with us there. Uh, you can send emails to me and, uh, and just kind of get in touch with us. And so, again, IndianLandCC.com is the, uh, the place to navigate to for that. So uh, before we get started here, let me just go ahead and open us uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we just want to thank you today for um, for meeting with us here in this time, Lord, and for uh, the opportunity that we have to gather together digitally. And Lord, I just pray that uh, today, as we are engaging uh, in this time of worship together, Lord, I pray that um, that everything that is said and done here uh, will be used to glorify your name, Lord, and to advance your kingdom. God, I just pray for each person who is watching and engaging Lord, I just pray that you meet with them, that you let them know that you're there in a special and unique way. And Lord, I just pray that uh, that at the end of all of this, at the end of uh, of this uh, next few minutes that we have together, Lord, I pray that it is 
uh, that it is your word that resonates with them, Lord, that it is your, uh, your will that uh, transpires in their lives, and Lord, that, uh, that you are just lifted up in all things, and that they walk away knowing you a little bit better, and Lord, if it's uh, someone who doesn't know you personally yet, Lord, I just pray that in this time, um, that you would just call them, that you would speak to their hearts, and Lord, that you would just bring them into relationship with you. Lord, we give this time to you, and we uh, just love you. We thank you for this opportunity, and it's through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, just wanted to uh, to let you know we're we're in the middle of this uh, series. Actually, we're, we're reaching the end. This is our last uh, our last sermon on this series of us and them. And again, if you've uh, if you've not been with us for the whole thing, you can go back through the website and you can uh, you can grab some of those uh, previous messages. Um, but anyway, but this series is about us and them, those of us who are Christians. And we've been talking about how easy it is for us as Christians um, to kind of forget about them, to look down on them, to, to kind of have this apathy and, and, and to, um, to almost have a, a negative response to people who are not like us, those who are not Christians, those who, um, who don't exactly live the way we live or have the same values or beliefs that we have. And really, we know that this is, that this is wrong. In our first week, we saw that, um, that Jesus calls us, he calls us to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into the harvest. And as Christians, we are those workers. And so we're supposed to be out in the harvest. We're supposed to be out in the world, engaging people and sharing our lives and sharing the good, the good news and the gospel of who Jesus is. And, and as, part of, as part of this process, we've been talking about uh, those who are close to us but are far from God. And just a quick reminder that uh, being far from God doesn't necessarily mean that the person is out uh, raising all kind of sin and they're um, that they are living a lifestyle that is um, that is wildly uh, filled with debauchery and all kind of stuff. It just means that it's someone who's not walking in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, um, f- to, for someone to be far from God doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, that they are living wildly and that they are um, that they are doing things that all of us can see. And we just kind of scratch our heads and go, what is wrong with you? Um, Being far from God just means that you're not in relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's you today, I want to pray and encourage you that you you, you take a step today to become um, in the fold with Jesus Christ. That you take a step today to become in relationship with him. But again, as we've been talking about this, um, we've been praying about that one person that we all know. We all know somebody, right? We all know somebody who is close to us, but they're far from God. They're not in relationship with Jesus yet. And over the course of this series, we've been talking about um, how to engage with that one person, how to engage with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with our culture at large, um, so that we can bear witness and we can share the good news. And uh, we can step into God's uh, mission and participate in his mission of reconciliation and, and loving the world and, and reconciling the world. And so uh, last week we were challenged to process through the question of who Jesus is. And, and hopefully all of us have had time to kind of process this week and we've prayed through the process this week of determining who Jesus is to us. And we saw, um, we saw that Jesus asked this question of the disciples, who do people say I am? And we kind of talked through um, how the people of the day when Jesus was walking on the earth, they, they were looking at him and they were thinking maybe he was a reincarnated prophet, maybe he was reincarnated John the Baptist. Um, but either way, they saw that he was a mighty man called by God. He, was, um, he had God's power on him, and uh, they just didn't recognize him to be the son of the living God. And when he asked then the disciples, hey, who do you say I am? And Peter, of course, responds, and he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, of course, Jesus confirms that what he has said is true, and he also lets us know that Peter didn't know this because somebody told him. He, he knew this because God had revealed it to him. And so we've kind of been talking about this, but we want, we want to know that um, for us personally, for me personally, for you personally, who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. But then let's take that a little bit deeper. And, and what does that mean to me in my personal relationship with Jesus? Who is he to me? And who is he to you in your personal relationship with him? And so hopefully over the last week uh, and over this, this series and even in the coming weeks, uh, you will continue to process through that. You'll be able to put words to that. 
um, and it'll become uh, very clear and very evident to you exactly who Jesus is and how he impacts your life day in and day out. And so, uh, again, today we're going to dig into this, and hopefully through our process today we're going to get a little more clarity as to who Jesus is and, uh, and even give us uh, some more language, some more tools to work with as we are engaging the world, as we're trying to share the hope and the truth and the love of Christ with those around us. And so uh, today as we dig into our discussion, uh, we're going to be looking at John's letter. We're going to be talking about who Jesus is, and we're going to be looking at this specific example in John's letter. And again, uh, we know that the Bible that we, we have access to today on our phones and, and in the print version uh, of the book uh, that these are letters, these are documents that were actually written by people uh, who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, who were inspired by God. Um, they re- recorded these things, they wrote these things down, and then God miraculously preserved them and allowed them to be uh, uh, curated and brought together into one document. And so today we're going to be looking at John's letter uh, in the New Testament. And of course, John uh, gives us some great insight, and uh, he gives us some some stories, uh, some some uh, eyewitness accounts, some some different things about who Jesus is, and we see the activity of Jesus as he walked on this earth. And so today we're going to be picking up with uh, John 11 and 12. We're going to kind of uh, cherry pick a few passages. We're going to talk about uh, some different things that Jesus did here. And, and the big thing that we're going to focus on is the story of Lazarus. The story of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus, he was a man who lived in Bethany. He was a relative. He was the brother of Mary and Martha. And those of you who have been in church for a little while, those of you uh, who study the Bible, you know about Mary and Martha. And, and Jesus has had some encounters with them. And uh, and so here's here's their brother. And, and Jesus in, is in relationship with this family. And, and, of course, Mary and Martha know who Jesus is. And, and, of course, they have this brother, Lazarus. And so Lazarus has been sick. Um, so if we kind of think about it in today's, uh, in today's uh, uh, culture and, and what we're going through right now, you know, maybe he got something that's like this coronavirus, like COVID-19, and he's fallen ill and he's really sick and, and it looks like he's about to die. And of course, Mary and Martha, they know who Jesus is. They understand that he has the ability and the power to, uh, to heal completely. He's, he has done this. They've, they've seen this firsthand. And so they know exactly who Jesus is. And so they send word to Jesus and they, they say, hey, look, our brother Lazarus has fallen ill and he's not getting better. But we know, Jesus, we know that if you come, if you come quickly, that you can heal him, that you can save him, that you can restore his health, you can give him new life. And they sent word to Jesus, and uh, of course, Jesus received the message. And what's really, what's really interesting here is if you, if you go back in and you read through, uh, through these chapters, if you, if you go back and you read John chapter 11 and 12 in their entirety, you'll see some of these different things But um, that I'm just going to kind of tell you about. We're not going to really read them, but if you go back and you read this, you see that Jesus received this message. And what's really interesting is he got this message and he didn't drop everything he was doing. He was in the middle of doing something. He was, he was in the middle of a different little community in a different town. He got the message and he says, okay, we'll go take care of this, but I'm going to take a couple of days and finish what I'm doing here and then we will go. And so he informs the disciples um, after they wrap things up, he tells them, let's go. Now, I just kind of want to pause here for a second and just say, you know what, sometimes we feel like this, right? We, we know that um, there's something going on in our lives, and we pray, and we ask God to, to meet our need. We ask God to give us something that we long for, something that we desire, and he doesn't necessarily respond in the time or in the way that we expect him to, Right? He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't immediately drop everything else that he's doing and come and give us what we're wanting. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't answer us. It just means that he doesn't do it in the way or in the time that we expect. And so uh, that's what we're seeing here. Jesus receives this message. It's basically uh, Mary and Martha praying, God, just, just help save our brother. And they send a message to Jesus. And Jesus says, we'll be there soon. And so Jesus delayed. He took his time getting there. And, of course, Lazarus dies. He passes away. Uh, 
And, uh, and this is where we're going to pick up uh, here, John 11, and we're going to pick up with verse 25. Now, of course, by this time, Jesus has arrived on the scene. He's coming into town. He's coming into Bethany, and, uh, and he gets there, and Martha comes out to meet him. And Jesus, and this is picking up with verse 25 in chapter 11, Jesus said to her, talking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And of course she responds, Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah and the Son of God who comes into the world. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar at all? We were just talking about this. Who do you say I am? Martha, this is who I am. Do you believe that this is who I am? And of course her response is, Yes, Lord, I know that you are the Messiah, the Son of God very similar answer that Peter gave, right? You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And so it's really interesting because here we see Jesus say exactly who he is. He says exactly who he is. He says that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And, and again, Martha understood, she understood that all who die having faith in Jesus would eventually be resurrected. They would again live one day. And, and apparently Jesus had taught and, and she understood this that at some point in time Jesus was going to come back and everyone who had died would be resurrected to life again. And so she had this understanding. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. She just didn't understand that Jesus could raise Lazarus back to life now. See, Lazarus was dead. Martha and Mary were upset. They were mourning the loss of their brother. And Jesus is saying, I'm the resurrection. I am the life. I can bring your brother back. He, wasn't, he didn't say this plainly and boldly to her, but she, he, he, he said, I have the ability. I am the resurrection. I am the life. So they have this exchange about how Jesus could have saved him had only he been there. If he'd been on the scene before Lazarus died and, and, and Jesus, um, had Jesus only acted in Mary and Martha's timing, had he, had he responded as soon as he got the message, had he, had he taken the action that they were wanting him or they were expecting him to take, in the time that they wanted or expected him to take, he could have saved Lazarus' life. And what we're going to see here is if he had actually done that, something would have been missed. Something would have been missed. He would have exchanged something good for something great. And that's what we're going to see here in this uh, next part. And so, of course, they're talking and, uh, and they're saying, hey, Jesus, Lazarus has died. We've already buried him. And so Jesus says, hey, where did you put him? Where is he now? Take me to the tomb. And so picking up with verse 38 in John chapter 11, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and it had a stone lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said, and Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there is already a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus told her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. you heard, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they might believe you sent me. And after he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. So this is really interesting here, right? Okay, so we see Jesus walking onto the scene. He tells them to remove the stone and then he prays and he prays this prayer out loud. And it's really interesting what he says because he, he, he prays a thanksgiving prayer to God. He says, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for hearing. I know that you already know what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do. Thank you for hearing me. And then, and this is really interesting, and, and this is going to play into what you and I, what all of us need to do as we are engaging them, the lost people of this world. He says, he says, I'm praying this. I'm saying this out loud. I'm saying it because of this crowd. Notice that Jesus saw the crowd 
saw the crowd and what he says he says so that the crowd would see believe and understand that the living God sent him now again it is a vocal presentation that is given as an example um, to remind us that we have to be vocal right we've, we've talked about this in the past weeks that it's not about just living a, a good life right um, because our, our good life isn't uh, isn't what is, isn't what saves us it is not the example that we need to be setting per se that uh, that leads people to Jesus but our good life they will see our good works the Bible tells us they will see our good works but that should engage into a conversation that turn that should turn into a conversation where we then use our words where we use the thing that God leads us to say in our spirit to where we share the truth where we share the good news and so again it's a vocal presentation of exactly who Jesus is. Jesus is using words, not just his life, to share about who he is. Now, just think about that for just a second, and we're going to move on. But think about it. Here's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and it's not just about people seeing him walking around and doing the great things that he did, but it's also about this verbal presentation. He's saying this. He's saying this out loud so that people will hear it. He's using his words, not just his life, to share about who he is. So Jesus calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus, get up, come on out. And Lazarus responds, and he, and he gains new life. And the big thing for us to notice here is that, that when Jesus calls each of us, he calls each of us, and when we respond, we gain new life. Jesus calls us, right? Right? Anybody who has responded to the call of Christ, if you claim to be a Christian, Jesus called you. He called to you. He, he, he spoke to you through the Holy Spirit. He spoke to you through someone sharing their story, through someone sharing the gospel about him. Someone spoke to you, and Jesus called you. And when you respond, you gain new life. You see, each and every single one of us, we're dead in our sin. And when Jesus calls us, he brings us to new life. When Jesus calls each of us and we respond, we gain new life. Lazarus walked out of the tomb. Walked out of the tomb. He's wrapped up. He's bound. He's, he's got cloth on his head. He's been prepared um, uh, for burial. They, they've fixed his body. And he's been dead. He's been in the tomb for four days. And Jesus calls him out. Now notice that there's no mention of a stench. There's no notice. Uh, there's, no, there's no mention uh, uh, of a deteriorated body. Lazarus walks out. And when they tear away the, the, the ceremonial wrappings and everything else that they buried him in, here's this guy living and breathing and walking with Jesus. Lazarus walked with Jesus in relationship. After he comes out, he spends time traveling with Jesus. He's, 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 he's walking and he's talking with Jesus. He's walking and he's talking with people around as he's walking around. And, and of course, we're taking a little bit of liberty here in the text because we don't see what, what Lazarus is saying to people or, or, or anything like that. But I just can't imagine, right? Hey, guys, just a few hours ago, I was completely dead. I was wrapped up in linen strips, and, and I was dead. I was buried. I'd been buried for four days. If that were you, would you be able to keep quiet about it? Would you be able to keep quiet about it? Uh, no, I, I don't think you would, and, and I don't think Lazarus did. And I think as Lazarus was walking around and he was engaging with the people around him and the, and the people around Jesus, he was sharing his story. He was talking about it. My question to us today is, are we walking with Jesus and are we talking about how he's brought us back to life? Uh, I'm afraid that we just, we, we become complacent. And again, going back to that question of who do we say that Jesus is and do we actually say who he is to anybody around us? And that is one of our challenges is to be able to talk about who Jesus is and how he has impacted our lives. And the crowd was starting to believe in Jesus the crowd was seeing a changed life. One who was once dead is now alive in and through Christ. Our lives have been changed by the good news. 
your life, my life, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you claim him as your Savior, our lives have been changed by the good news, the good news of Christ. And, and thinking about this, you know, again, going back to those who see us and, and living a life that reflects who Jesus is, and, and Paul tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that it is, that it is our worthy duty, that it, that, it is, that it is our good practice to live a life as a living sacrifice, right? That we, that we live holy and pleasing to God. And so in that process, people are seeing us, just like Lazarus is walking around. He's walking around with Jesus, and he's talking to people, and they're seeing a life that has been changed. They're, they're seeing a life that has been transformed. They're seeing a man who was once dead, now alive. And now, thinking about us, we were once dead in our sins, and now, after we accept Jesus Christ, we're walking around a new creation. We were walking around in new life. The crowd was seeing a life that was transformed and they were hearing the good news of a Savior who gave new life. The crowd was seeing all that was going on. They were seeing a life that had been transformed and they were hearing the good news of a Savior who gave new life. The activity didn't go unnoticed. The activity didn't go unnoticed. The crowd was seeing all of this stuff, and there's some we see in the Scripture where, where some in the crowd, they were walking around, they followed, they believed, but then there were others who went uh, to the Pharisees and to the, and to the priests and to the other religious leaders, and they told them what was going on, and of course, this activity didn't go unnoticed by the Pharisees, right? And so they're always looking for an opportunity to jump in and cause some trouble for Jesus. And so we're picking up at verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and were saying, what are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And just a real quick note, if you're reading a different version than what we're putting on the screen here, that, that word place in some translations is, is given as our temple, right? It, so, so what they're concerned about here, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they're gathered together and they're discussing what's going on. And, and they're saying Jesus is doing a bunch of miracles and people are starting to believe in him. And the religious leaders feared losing their power and their position. They feared losing their power. They're not upset at Jesus right now because of him being a heretic, right? That's one of their claims throughout the scriptures is as, as they're engaging, as Jesus is out talking and he's forgiving sin, they're like, wait a minute, only God can do that. Are you claiming to be God? And of course, they're seeing Jesus as a heretic. But right now in this moment, they're not concerned about his heretical teaching. They're upset that he was going to cause a Roman army to come and destroy their kingdom their kingdom was in jeopardy. The religious leaders, these, these Pharisees, these guys who were supposed to be sharing the love of God with those around them, they were more concerned about their own kingdom getting destroyed because of the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. They're more concerned about maintaining their normal than they are about having new life. They're more, concern, they're more concerned about their normal life than they are about having new life. And I believe that that's part of our problem today in today's culture. We're more concerned. The world is more concerned. And even sometimes us as Christians, we're more concerned about maintaining our normal than we are about sharing the good news that leads to new life. People don't want to latch on to Jesus because they're afraid. they afraid that it's going to disrupt their normal life. And they're missing the point that there is new life. There is new life. There is something bigger than what is in their kingdom right here, right now in this world. Moving on. John 12, picking up at verse 17. We're moving over to John 12 now. Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him, uh, him, Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. So the crowd was there around. They were talking about what had happened. This is also why the crowd met him uh, as, he's going back into, uh, as he's going back into the city. This is, this is leading into the Holy Week um, and, uh, and everything else. But here's, here, so as they, this is why they came and they met him because they heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, 
you see you haven't accomplished nothing. You've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Again, this is their worst nightmares coming true. They see Jesus rolling into town and all of a sudden the whole world. Everybody in their sphere, everybody that's in their community is starting to flock to Jesus. You've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. People who believe they saw Jesus call Lazarus from the grave. They saw Lazarus walking with him. They heard the stories. They heard about how Jesus gives new life. And they were testifying. They became believers and they were sharing the truth. And notice, notice what the Pharisee says. The world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. Now again, bringing this to our current, current situation, and, and we kind of touched on this, but many of us and them are ready for things to get back to normal because we're in this quarantine, we're in this shelter at home, we're in this stay safe, social distancing mode, and we're so ready for everything to just get back to normal. I'm ready to, to go and, and, and sit down for lunch face-to-face -face with somebody somewhere else besides my house, right? Uh, I, and my kids are longing to get out and, and to go play with friends and to have sleepovers and do the stuff that they, they used to do. We're ready for the normal to happen. But what if this, what if this COVID-19, what if this breakout is actually a call to a new normal? What if this is the call to the new normal? For Christians, the normal remain the same as our normal is supposed to be sharing the good news. See, as Christians, our normal activity is supposed to be walking with Jesus and share, sharing the truth of who he is, walking in relationship with him and testifying to others about who he is. Our normal is supposed to be sharing the good news. So when all of this is over with, will we go back to our normal, whatever that looked like? Was our normal sharing the truth? Was our normal walking with Jesus in close relationship so that things that kind of overflow out of us talk about who he is and speak to who he is? Will our new normal be somewhat different than what our old normal was? Will we go into a normal phase of sharing who Jesus is? Now, how great would it be? Think about this. How, how, how great would it be on the other side of this if there was a revival? If there was a revival, what if God is using COVID-19 as a moment to spark a revival in this country and around the world? What if this is a mighty move of God and many of them are shifting to a new normal? Many of them, those who are, who are far from God, what if, what if there is a new normal beginning in them? They're, they have a fire that is lighting inside them for Christ. And their new normal is gonna be sharing the good news of Christ with their lost friends? What if the world started going after him? What would that look like? What if we were to see, like the Pharisees saw, the world going after him, the world going after Jesus? What would that look like? Lazarus was called to new life and he walked in relationship with Christ and that's, that's what all of us need to do in order to reach them. We need to walk in relationship with Jesus and testify about who he is and what he has done for us. We need, to, we need to tell people that we were dead. I was dead in my sin. I was dead until Jesus called me. He called me back to life. He called me out of the tomb. He called me into a life with him. What if they see us walking around and they realize that we were dead and now we're alive? And they see us living a life that points to something different from what they see in the rest of the world. What if, what if then they hear us sharing the good news? What if they hear us sharing about who Jesus is and testifying about what he's done in us? When they see us walking around and being different, does that engage in a conversation? Does it lead to a conversation where we're then able to vocalize and say, this is why my life looks a little bit different from somebody else. This is, this is not my ability and my work, but it is the work of Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of the living God working in my life, working in my life to give me new life. We have the opportunity to invest time in our story 
of our Savior into other people. We have time. We have the opportunity to invest in other people, to share our story and to share Christ's story of how he's working us, working in us. And we get to invite them into a new life with Christ. We get to invite them into a new life. And this brings us to the big question. Actually, I guess there's two really big questions that, that, uh, that we should be thinking about as we kind of close out this series. And, and this is sort of the underpinning questions of, of this whole us and them series. But uh, the two big things that we need to walk away from uh, this series having answered is what does a person have to know to become a Christian? What does a person have to know to become a Christian? And then secondly, what does a person need to do to become a Christian? What does a person need to do to become a Christian? Now, and, and I'm afraid that as a church, as the church, we've kind of made this a little more complicated than it really needs to be. I mean, if you look at, at Scripture, Jesus doesn't start out with giving everybody the law. and He doesn't start out with giving them all of this direction. He just says, follow me. Follow me. Come and see. Come and see. You'll see what I do. You'll hear what I say. Just come and see. So we want to keep this simple. So what does a person have to know to become a Christian? And, and what does a person need to do to become a Christian? And, and just ke- keeping this simple, just keeping it as simple as possible, I want to point you to John three sixteen and 17. John chapter 3, 16 and 17. And most of you, whether you've been in church or not, you know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him should, have, should not perish but have everlasting life. So I want to break that down for us today. So again, John 3, 16 and 17, we're going to have this on the screen. And this is the, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the CSB version. It says, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So now if we, if we break this down to the most simplest statements, it shows up like this. Again, it's real simple. God loved. God loved. And then we see that God gave. And then, and then we see that if we believe in him, if we believe this, and, we, were, and we, we, we call out and we say that we believe, then we receive. So see, God sees us and he knows us and he loves us. God loved us before we were born. He loves us. He loves you. And he gave us, he gave you, he gave me his son as the Savior. So God loved, he saw us, he knows us, he loves us. And God gave, he sent his son, he gave us his son, he gave us a way to be reconciled. He sent the Messiah, the son of the living God. All right? So, it, so it, it, if you know this, right, if you know that God loves you and that God made a way for you to be reconciled to him, if you know those two things, if you know that God loves you and that his son, Jesus Christ, was sent here, was crucified on a cross, was dead, buried, and was resurrected into life, and he ascended to the Father and he's alive today, if you know that, if you believe that, once you believe it, if you believe in him, if you believe that this is true, you trust that he is who he says he is, then you receive. You receive it. If you say, Jesus, I know that you are who you say you are, and I am dead in my sin, and I need you to save me. If you say that, if you believe that, then you gain salvation. You gain hope. You gain reconciliation. You gain a relationship. You receive a relationship with Christ for all of eternity. God loved, God gave. We believe, we receive. It's so simple. It's so simple. We've tried to make it so difficult and so hard. It's not about getting all the mess in your life cleaned up. It is about knowing that God loves you, that God gave his son for you. And if you believe that, then you receive salvation. As we head into Easter next week, and we're facing such a unique time, right? This is, such a, this is such a crazy time for us to be going through Easter, a time when we usually gather together in large, large groups and, and, and we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Let's think about and pray for our one person this week. Let's pray for God to give us a chance to share with them that God loves, 
that God gave. And if they believe, then they're able to receive. Let's pray that God gives us that opportunity to, to invite them to join us in a relationship with him, the Savior of the world. And again, if you're watching today and you're responding to this and, and you're saying, okay, God, I, I know that you love me. I know that you gave your son. I believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that he's still alive and that he loves me and that he's offering a way for me to, to have a relationship with you. If you believe that and you say that, then you will receive salvation. And just, just pray to God and just tell him. Just say, God, I believe it. I need it. And I invite you into my life. I want to have a relationship with you. And if you do that today, then you will receive salvation today. And friends, if you've, if you've just said that, if you've just done that, I want you to send me an email, shannon at indianlandcc.com, and let's get into a conversation about it. Whether you're involved with Indian Land Community Church, whether you're in York or Fort Mill or, or, or in Charlotte or, or in the Carolinas or somewhere around the world, I want to do my best to help you get connected into a fellowship with other Christians so that you can walk in this new life with others so that you can be encouraged, so that you can be discipled, so that you can come into a better understanding of what it means to live in relationship with Jesus. For those of us, for those of us who have been Christians, and we've maybe not been as vocal, maybe we've not been as close in relationship with Jesus, I want to challenge us today to keep this in mind, to look at the life of Lazarus, the dead man who's called to life, and to be reminded that today we are called to life that we're called to life and that God wants us to share our testimony, to tell the world about the life that we have in Christ, about who he is to us and what it means to walk in relationship with him, that God loves us, that he gave his son for us, that we believe it and we've received salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we just love you. We thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your son for us. And Lord, as we head into this holy week and we reflect this week on, on the life of Christ and the, and the resurrection, God, we just, uh, we just pray that we're mindful of what it truly means, what it truly means, that the grave is empty today, whether we're gathered together in our church buildings, Lord, if they're empty, the tomb is empty. God, if they're filled, the tomb is still empty. God, no matter where we are, we know that Jesus was rose uh, back to life, that he was brought back to life, and that he is sitting at your right hand right now. And Lord, we know that all we have to do is call out to you and just believe, just to put our faith in you. And we know that you save us. We know that you love us. We know that you want a relationship with us, and we're so thankful for it. Lord, I just pray that over the last few minutes as we've shared this truth, God, I pray that if there's somebody's watching, Lord, I just pray that you move right now in their spirit. You move right now in their lives. And Lord, that you invest in them, that you uh, put someone in their lives that will invite them, that will be the mouthpiece, that will be the flesh and skin and bones of, uh, of who you are speaking into them. Lord, I just pray that if you're calling them right now, Lord, that you prompt them to respond. And Lord, that you save them. Lord, it's not up to any of us to save, but, but God, it's only you who can save. And Lord, we just trust you with that, and we just pray that you do that mighty work today and every day. Lord, allow us to be part of your harvest. Allow us to water. Allow us to plant seeds. Lord, allow us to, to reap the harvest, to be the ones who, who invest in people and invite them into a relationship with you and knowing that you are faithful and that you will do the work of saving. God, we just love you. We thank you for this day. And it's through the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. And again, truly, I invite you to reach out if you have questions about anything um, to do with Christianity, with the church, uh, with the gospel about how to have a new life that is in Christ. Please reach out to us. You can find us online at indianlandcc.com. Until next time, I pray that you are safe, that uh, you experience God in a new and real way this week. Have a great day.